I'm Lisa Austin and I want to welcome you to tonight's Erie Bayfront Town Hall. Several years ago, PennDOT shared their vision for our waterfront, a roadway where no car or truck would ever have to stop. Tonight's extraordinary speakers are going to help us understand why PennDOT's vision for the Bayfront will harm our economy, hurt the environment, reduce pedestrian connectivity, and increase social injustice. I'm gonna turn over the event now to our first speaker. Good evening, hi, my name is Jill Wachowski heaps I'm an attorney with Earth Justice. Uh, if you're not familiar with Earth Justice, we are the nation's premier nonprofit public interest environmental organization. Um, I have been working on National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA cases um, for 17 years. I won my first case 15 years ago. Um, and won it again four years later because they came back with the same project uh, and, and had other issues with it. Um, today I'm going to give you a quick background on NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, how it um, relates to this project, and specifically touching on what is an environmental assessment, what is a categorical exclusion, and how does this, um, how do these differences impact public input? I'm gonna share my screen. If for some reason I'm having technical difficulties, if one of the presenters could just um, unmute and tell me I'm having problems, that would be great. Okay, today's um, topic is how the law can facilitate or prevent public input in highway projects. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the National Environmental Policy Act, it is our premier environmental law and the nation's first environmental law. Um, and it's primarily a sunshine law, which is shedding light on a proposed federal project. It applies to major federal projects, um, not state projects alone. And it, the basic idea behind NEPA is to understand environmental and human impacts of a project before resources are committed or before the project is started. Um, and it's basically a look, look before you leap statute. It says you can pretty much make a dumb decision, but you gotta let the public know what your decision is before you make it. So how does NEPA work? The, the main idea behind NEPA is looking to see if the project is going to have significant impacts, particularly significant environmental impacts. If we know from the get-go that this is a huge, huge project that will have significant environmental impacts, um, the agency will start with an environmental impact statement. These can be thousands upon thousands of pages long, um, record of decision with multiple appendices. Um, um, some, many highway projects actually use an environmental impact statement. Uh, there's one project in Syracuse right now where they're um, looking to remove the elevated portion of Highway um, Interstate 81 and put it at road level. And they are using, uh, New York DOT is using an environmental impact statement in that process. Um, when an environmental impact statement is put together, an important part is that there is formal notice and comment. That means that the, the draft documents are um, put out to the public. The public has an opportunity to review and comment on it, um, basically making sure that the decisions are not arbitrary and capricious, uh, and making sure that, that the decisions basically make sense and that all the environmental impacts have been studied. If we're not sure if a project is gonna have significant impacts, but probably won't have significant impacts, um, the law requires an environmental assessment. Now an environmental assessment is often called, is initially called a quick and dirty study of a project. Um, and while environmental assessment many years ago used to only be 40 or 50 pages long, um, these days environmental assessments can be hundreds of pages as well. Um, an important thing about environmental assessment is that um, the project applicant needs to identify the project purpose and the need. So in this case, if we're identifying the project purpose, is it a purpose, is it the project really to help um, reduce accidents and to um, increase pedestrian accessibility to the bayfront? Um, and what's the need for that? And then you would look at alternatives and really seeing which alternative actually meets the pro pur project purpose and need. So in our case um, here, if you have an alternative where you're actually building a highway, but you're claiming your purpose is to increase pedestrian access, uh, you may have a problem here where your al selected alternative doesn't meet your purpose, project, and need. Uh, in other cases, we've seen projects that has a project purpose that's um, 
defined so narrowly that only one alternative could possibly work. Um, but the point of an environmental assessment is just to bring these, the project and the need and the alternatives to light and to bring public input to these. And also important here is uh, a comprehensive look at environmental impacts. Um, for example, in this case, we would look at stormwater impacts. If you're going to build a highway, um, are you going to have more stormwater runoff? Um, are you gonna be um, creating more stormwater runoff in impaired waterways that are on either end of the Bayfront Parkway? Um, and also with an environmental assessment, an agency um, has a duty to um, comply with Executive Order 12898, which is about environmental justice and actually taking a, a hard look to see how the project would impact environmental justice um, communities and, and neighborhoods. If the environmental assessment reveals that there are significant impacts to the project, um, the agency will do an environmental impact statement. But often, um, instead, they come to a different conclusion. They do formal notice and comment, and then they do a, hey, we got a FONSI, a finding of no significant impact, which basically means they've done all the analysis and we don't find any significant impact here. The other option is a, a mitigated FONSI. If there are potential significant impacts, but the agency can um, commit to mitigation measures that will make those impacts less than significant, they will issue a mitigated FONSI. There are requirements for formal notice and comment um, before an agency issues a FONSI or a mitigated FONSI um, that may or may not include a public hearing. But in either way, both an environmental assessment and an environmental impact statement involve significant paperwork and significant formal opportunities for the public to be involved. Um, because of industry pressure, uh, this council uh, CEQ, the White House Council of Environmental Quality, said, hey, if we really know that there, this is the type of project that we know will not have um, significant impacts, we can um, issue a categorical exclusion. These are for supposed to be for particular categories of projects like road resurfacing. Um, and the idea behind the regulations is we list 20 or 30 different kinds of projects that we know through our experience will not have environmental impacts. Um, and then we go through a process where we show that this categorical exclusion applies. Um, the tricky thing about this formal notice and comment, no. Basically, once a categorical exclusion applies, there is no requirement for formal notice and comment. And basically, the agency can go forward with their um, go forward with their um, project without having to formally involve the public. Um, what seems to be strange here is that um, Pend um, Pandat basically went through, started an environmental assessment and then said, hey, looks like we're not gonna have any environmental impact, so let's try to get a categorical exclusion. Except if you see from the process here that's supposed to take place, the outcome of an environmental assessment usually is finding a no significant impact. So what they're doing is they, they were having the same outcome, right? No significant impact, but they've skipped this whole formal notice and comment period, um, which is why if there's any possible way for us to get into the environmental assessment or environmental impact statement land, that's where we would wanna be from a public uh, input standpoint. Um, with that, that is your quick and dirty lesson on NEPA and categorical exclusions. My seven minutes are up. I'm going to hand it over now to Raul Garcia, my uh, colleague from Earth Justice. Thank you so much, Jill. Um, and and, and as, as you can see, so, so my name is Raul Garcia. I, I work uh, also at Earth Justice in our policy and legislation uh, office here in Washington, D.C. Um, unfortunately, NEPA has starting to, it started to be used a lot in, in, by communities themselves to speak up and have a voice in what's actually happening in their backyard. And unfortunately, Congress is, is now taking notice and, and has actually acted to strip some of that away. Uh, and so we see a conglomerate, a conglomerate of attacks coming uh, on the law that strip it away, but, but it's still very strong in the way that, 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 that it operates, particularly giving communities a voice. Uh, in this process. As Jill mentioned, throughout the NEPA process and the entire NEPA process is, is basically based on three basic principles. The first one is transparency. So Jill mentioned the sunshine element, right? We need, 
the public should know what the federal government wants to do in its backyard, right? I don't, I don't think there's an argument there. Uh, the second one is informed decision-making. We need to study what we're about to do. We need to figure out what the impacts are gonna be that, that, that we're gonna create. And, and uh, you know, obviously this is the look before you leap, right? You, you're not jumping into an area, into a space, into an impact that you don't know anything about. The last thing, and what I would argue is essentially the most important piece of NEPA is public input. So it's giving the public a voice, the public who has expertise that people in Washington DC don't have, that people in, in other parts of the same state might not have, about how this project should look like and what are we gonna and, and, and what are the tweaks that the public can offer? You know, are, are we talking about um, not doing the project? Or are we talking about doing things to improve the project? All of this happens through the NEPA process. So a lot of people in Congress like to say, well, you know, it's, it's red tape. It's things that, that we don't need, it's bureaucracy. And you saw President Trump actually coming out, grabbing a bunch of binders and saying, we're gonna throw this away. And he just threw these binders on the floor. What no one asked at that press conference, what, what is in those binders? What is he throwing on the floor? What is he dismissing? And most of those binders were composed of comments from the communities themselves about what the project impacts were going to be on their families, on their children. And he just managed to throw that away. And unfortunately, we see that throughout the country, project by project in which either state or federal agencies take these binders and they say, we don't care. We're just going to move forward. And so the voice of that mother who has two jobs, has to provide for their family, and still wants to have a voice in this process is completely ignored. And that's simply not fair. It's only not unfair, but it can actually violate the law. Because that's what NEPA is there to prevent. NEPA is there to ensure that people all around the country can have a voice in the, in the building of the infrastructure that's going to be in their backyards. So when I heard about this project, I just, I was so enthusiastic about this because it's one, it, it's an incredible organizing effort that's already happening on the ground. It's clearly the people on the ground speaking for themselves. And NEPA is the process that allows them to speak for themselves. So when PennDOT and other federal agencies are trying to take that process away, we take that very seriously at Earth Justice. We want to investigate what's going on here. Um, and, and, and it's important to take into, into account because uh, things don't add up. As Jill mentioned, we're hearing that this project is supposed to do one thing, that the goal is to do one thing, but then we see that the impacts are actually going to be in other. And so we need full transparency and we need consistency in that process. However, I want to make sure that, the, the, that, that we're being completely transparent about this effort. The importance behind NEPA is the voice of the community. NEPA alone won't fix the problem. NEPA creates an avenue, creates a process by which communities are empowered to have a seat at the table so that the interests of those communities are met. Now, keep in mind what I'm saying. What I, mean by, what I mean is that the communities themselves need a seat at the table, not just the governmental or agency officials. You need to bring in representatives who have uh, a diversity of interests in this project in order to get a whole picture of what the project is actually going to do and how it's going to function. Now, looking at it from the outside, I don't know what's best for Erie, Pennsylvania. But the community of Erie, Pennsylvania does know what's best for that community. And so that means that agencies need to humble themselves and need to go through the NEPA process correctly so that they can have an open, uh, an open mind to what the community has to say. Because again, the community on the ground knows best. And that means that the NEPA process allows for the community to have a say, but the community needs to organize. It needs to diversify and it needs to continue the drumbeat. To its extent, it also, and something that the community here is doing is offering alternatives that actually work for the community themselves, not just to add traffic, right? And so we're seeing this effort and it's blatantly disgusting 
that a federal agency and a state agency simply want to dismiss that effort. That effort should be taken into account. And in order to take it into account, it needs to go through the more thorough NEPA processes, like an environmental assessment or an environmental impact statement. Um, and so um, I'll leave it at that. But the, the last thing that I want to that, that highlight is that when we talk about building projects like this, that rarely happens in, in, the, in the richer side of towns. That rarely happens where people are affluent. You rarely see a power plant or a highway expansion segregating communities that, 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 that have resources. This usually happens in communities who, who are either low income or people of color. And those tend to be the ones most affected by it. And so it's quite infuriating seeing that when, when, when projects like this get pitched in those upper class communities, everything goes by the letter of the law. But when we go into communities of color and we impact, uh, and we impact them, suddenly we see a very different standard being, being implemented. That's a problem and that's precisely what the NEPA process should be addressing. It's a, pro it's a blanket process that should apply to all projects. It should not be dismissed in this case. Um, so with that, uh, I'll stop there and, and thank you everybody for, for attending. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Bennett. I am uh, the campaign manager for clean water advocacy at Penn Future here in Erie. I'm gonna share my screen here real quickly. And I'll get started. So um, Penn Future is a statewide environmental advocacy organization that is dedicated to ensuring clean water and clean air for all Pennsylvanians. We're also committed to promoting sustainable communities throughout the Commonwealth. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, I wanted to share a little bit of, of Penn Future's concerns with water quality and this Bayfront Parkway Improvement Plan. So we submitted public comment uh, June 4th uh, based on two major concerns. The first was the downscoping from an environmental assessment to a class two categorical exclusion. The reason that we were concerned about this, there were many, but one of the main things that, that kind of jumped out to us was that um, they cited no substantial controversy from stakeholders. Um, the, the issue there is that stakeholders that were participating in meetings in, in the public comment period prior to that were under the assumption that there was going to be an environmental assessment uh, for this project. So when it was downscoped to a class two categorical exclusion without stakeholder involvement um, at that point, that created substantial controversy. And that's one of the reasons that we're here today. Um, the other concern that we have is also that the um, categorical exclusion evaluation that it was, it's posted on the website now, it wasn't, hadn't been available before we submitted public comment. Uh, really doesn't mention long-term impacts to water quality due to increased runoff into Presque Isle Bay. Um, this is an expansion of the, the roadway that's already there, so you're going to have increased impervious services. So I wanted to take just a minute and explain, for those of you who maybe aren't, aren't familiar with the issue with impervious surfaces, to talk about that. Um, so this is a Google Earth image of the Bayfront Corridor. And if you just take a look at the colors in this image, you can see grays and browns and blacks really take up most of this image. Um, what those are, are roadways, uh, parking lots and buildings, and those are all impervious surfaces. What that means is that when it rains or when snow melts, water can't seep into the soil. Uh, water can't be absorbed by plants that are, that are there. Um, and so the problem, and then those of you who know Erie also know that the city is on an, is higher elevation than the Bayfront Corridor. So what happens when it rains, and especially when it rains hard, or when the snow melts, and we all know we get plenty of snow here, so good amount of snow melt, is that all of that water goes downhill. Um, let's take the case of a really uh, large rainstorm. That water is going to run off over the surface, either directly into the bay or into storm sewers. Um, and those storm sewers drain directly into the bay. They do not drink, go to the wastewater treatment plant and get treated before the water gets into the bay or into the lake. Um, so 
Erie already has an issue with impervious surface, especially in this location. To increase that impervious surface without any kind of study, without any kind of assessment on the impact of that water, that's a really big problem. To add to this, um, in my role, so I just started with Penn Future in March. Um, that's when, when Penn Future moved into Erie. I've been having conversations with as many stakeholders as I can, um, especially with our state agencies and scientists who are studying our waterways. And with every conversation I've asked, what is the number one threat to water quality in the Lake Erie watershed? Almost every single person who I've spoken to has said that runoff is the number one threat to water quality in the Lake Erie watershed. Um, that runoff comes in a lot of different forms. So we have agricultural runoff in our more rural parts of the county, but here in Erie, we have a major urban runoff problem. Uh, we don't have any, um, storm or uh, green stormwater infrastructure to offset that and clearly if you take a look at it we don't have a lot of green space especially in this location to offset that so that's one of our biggest biggest issues here um, we've been making you know we've, we've had a couple of letters to the editor or uh, opinion pieces that have published in erie times news and all of those are trying to make the point that our water resources are the most important resources to the region I mean, water is really important to everyone everywhere, but if we're talking about the future of this region, we have to protect the bay. We have to protect the lake um, because they also are our future. Um, you know, they're not just providing drinking water to 240,000 people, which is reason enough to protect them, but also we want to attract people. We want to attract tourists and, and uh, fishermen and women to our shores to bring to contribute to our economy. So for those reasons, Penn Future has a couple of requests to project or the, the project decision makers. Um, one is that we'd like to see an evaluation of the impact on Presque Isle Bay of run, increased runoff that could be expected when you're going to expand impervious surfaces. Uh, we'd also like to see a commitment to incorporating green stormwater infrastructure along those improvements, any improvements that are implemented down there. Um, green stormwater infrastructure, and you can see a couple of pictures of that on the right here, is not just planting, you know, not just making the space green or planting a few trees. Uh, they are engineered, usually engineered infrastructure that's going to absorb water runoff. So it will reduce runoff volume, which helps slow down that runoff. It also is going to reduce flooding, which is an increasing problem in the city of Erie. In addition to that, as the water is running off, um, as it runs off into green stormwater infrastructure, it's going to be filtered by these plants that are specifically chosen to do that job so that the water that does eventually reach Presque Isle Bay will be cleaner water um, and then the ad, you know, the last added benefit is it's beautiful green space, which is always great, but the functional green stormwater infrastructure is really what we would be looking for here. Hi, good evening, everyone. Just give me one second. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, again, good evening, everyone. Thank you for welcoming Designing the We um, to partake in a very important conversation that again, um, impacts sort of how we plan processes throughout the country. As our name indicates, Designing the We is really at looking at design as a movement building tool to really incorporate equitable outcomes within the built environment. And how does it take this stronger, more cohesive capital WE to really push such ideologies that are the undergirding of our democracy forward um, for all neighborhoods? A lot of our work, um, throughout the country really surrounds understanding crises from a systemic standpoint and how a myriad of decisions over time have curated again our current condition in the built environment of inequity. Um, what we try to do is really inform that a lot of our crises are centered around an interplay of certain components and our work really looks at human needs, what we as human beings need to thrive in the built environment, um, perception, how we think, empathize, and humanize, 
and the built environment, what we design to meet human needs based on our perceptions and how we're informed. And what we've come in the work that we're doing is understanding that the interplay between these three sections creates a lived experience. And, what, and, and the lived experience is really, as what we have come to conclude, um, based on a lot of perception. And our work uh, design often looks at how do we create outputs immediately that aesthetically meet a demand of a client that we're hired. And what we're arguing is that the perception of those who sit at the table, and it captures many of the comments that were made by the previous speakers, who's sitting at the table and how their sociological theory incorporates into occupational ideology really informs then how these outputs are equitable and really serve to promote a just and inclusive lived experience. Um, we have a three-pronged process of reframing, redesigning, and reinvesting that takes really a transdisciplinary approach to how do we create outputs. And a lot of our work has realized that there are conditions that hold systemic problems in place, whether it be isms of race, isms of class, isms of place of how geographical spatial dynamics play out, we understand that the way we think about things and how we've been inoculated to think produce what we play out as either binders being thrown in the garbage and a disregard of, de of basically dehumanizing how we incorporate people into processes. So our work looks at a core condition or a nucleus. We look at mental models, we look at how those mental models create relationships and connections um, and power dynamics and how those relationships and connections based on those mental models reinforce policies, practices and investments that oftentimes um, are executed without a deeper understanding of the long term collateral consequences. A lot of our work to date has been around the reframing aspect of, um, of, of the mental model and perception. In 2015, to aid us in our first stage um, of this work, we launched an exhibition called Undesign the Red Line. Undesign the Red Line is looking at the metaphorical red lines that really are reinforced um, in society that again, create this hierarchy of human value. And we, why this is be becomes important is that when we look at systems, macro systems, it's not just an environmental standpoint, which is significant, it's how the humanistic um, experience relates to environment and also what are we experiencing on a daily basis. And when we look at a trajectory of how we have arrived to where um, federal agencies or other stakeholders can make blanket decisions that again impact the built environment in ways that have um, again reinforced this hierarchy of human value, it really is a very complex system. And having public meetings once a month or once every six months to capture public opinion is insufficient to really contextualize how we again arrive to the conditions of what we've dealt with. Our work really begins with understanding the mental model of how many of the policies um, have surfaced. When we speak to people and we speak of people like Madison Grant, who um, actually Isabella Wilkerson speaks of in her new book, Cast. These are people with environmentalism um, backgrounds, conservationists that really reinforced practices like scientific racism and eugenics in the built environment. These were the leaderships. These were the people that were put in positions of authority to steward the ideologies and principles of democracy, but reinforced a paradigm that is still pervasive today of who is valuable and who isn't. And we know that we, we see how people like Homer Hoyt who come out of the University of Chicago, um, how planning, how architecture, how all of these design components really create things like redlining maps and redlining policies. And it's always, we're always taken aback how most people don't even know what these policies were. We know the New Deal, we romanticize the New Deal that did very good things for the infrastructure of America and essentially creates what we know as the American middle class. But places like Erie, um, New York City, and beyond, really the geographical footprint is set into motion as investments begin to calibrate into these areas. We're off of the, kneel, uh, of the heels of the uh, Great Depression. We're trying to create ways to restart the economy. Housing and job creation are a major factor. Most people don't understand that prior to the New Deal, in order to be a homeowner, it was unascertainable. 
you had to have 50% 50, 50 to put down, five to seven years to pay it off. And when the government gets involved in the ability to create the 15 to 30 year mortgage that we're very familiar with, we see that a legion of people are unleashed to sort of create a geographical footprint. The waterfront area that we're in, 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 in is involved in this conversation was a redlined area. And if you visit mapping inequality, you'll see what that means. You color code communities based on how you perceive value. What you see on this screen is an area description. And you see that in the area description, it's asking what is considered a detrimental influence. It begins to judge and reinforce a stereotype about who lives in a community and their value in a community. And as you can see from question C in this government document, that Negro infiltration is considered a detrimental influence. And even at this time, people who graduate into what's considered whiteness in America are, con are considered also infiltrators. And we see here in question E, um, Italian and Negro. Italians were not considered right, white until after World War um, II. And we see that this begins to mobilize how communities are bringing and building and, and, and having value. I am from the Bronx. We see how projects like the Cross Bronx Expressway sort of plow through our communities. This is an actual quote that I think it's worth reading um, to our, our, our audience, that this is not someone's personal opinion solely. This is what someone's personal opinion that has been standardized and codified into federal law and, and mandate, pushing this ideology of racially integrated neighborhoods or valuable neighborhoods. And if you take a minute and it's saying that if a neighborhood is to retain stability, it's necessary that property shall continue to be occupied by the same social and racial classes. And if, you, if you're setting this mandate as the federal government, then everyone else has a blanket ability to reinforce how we're going to create the socio-spatial dynamics of community. Areas that have historically been disinvested now are looked at pariah zones. We're not looking at how windows have gotten, have became broken in areas. We're now going to penalize the people in those communities and say that in somehow, in some way with this long trajectory, it's your fault why your community is the way it is. And therefore, we're going to have to seize this back and create opportunities that will bring in economic development. There, when you have, again, people using stereotypes of welfare queen, et cetera, we're tearing at the, at the um, social fabric of our communities. And, and we know that people like Lee Adwater, who was a Republican strategist on the Southern Strategy, in his well-known quote, is speaking about how we employ policy tactics that really then inform access. And this was his actual statement. This isn't something that's made up, but this is something he said. Um, and again, what happens when we now look at areas that from the naked eye will seem as disinvested or devalued, we don't look at a trajectory of how it arrived to here. And so we wanna throw investment into this area and is, is recreating areas that have been long um, disinvested in a bad thing? No, but the process of how we go about it and who we design and invest into it for d d demonstrates that what we're doing is reinforcing red lines. How? Because we know when we create anchor projects, whether they're waterfront developments, whether they're um, walkways, green walkways, whatever you coin them to be, predominantly in areas that investment had been um, uh, uh, disregarded, we know it creates a speculative frenzy. And in creating a speculative frenzy, and now with things like opportunity zones out there, what are the potentialities of areas now suffering and the people who have long been at these places being moved out into new redlined areas that suffer from the same um, disinvestment? This work we, we, we have done in Trenton, places like Trenton, New Jersey, um, where urban renewal and many other policies have really created, even to this day, metrics that look at areas as disinvested and devalued. Um, but what we have cultivated again through our process was looking at how do we work with community members and diverse stakeholders, not to create a passerby engagement process, but one that is fixated in community, led by community, and that really creates a, a nexus point to understand the moving cogs that community voices bring, but also what are the innovative approaches that we can do when we're looking at um, the ecosystem, not just the siloed project. So how does this 
come connect to something else? And how does that connect to something else, creating a shared value ecosystem? So these were some of the projects that we worked in in Trenton, looking at urban agriculture and how urban agriculture can drive local economy and how local economy can really create housing opportunities through community land trust models um, that again support an ecosystem of connectivity versus we're going to create this and disconnect the people that have long been um, sidelined and marginalized from this conversation from having any advantageous um, point and looking at things holistically. Um, and why perception becomes important and, and is at the base and, and it's so strong is because many of us hold, whether subconsciously or consciously, um, how we look at projects and who's entitled to be part of that table that was mentioned earlier. How does putting a little more effort in a design process that really looks at the different moving parts really creates a true democracy of not just having a voice, but activating opportunities to really incorporate the innovative outputs that are going to be necessary to really resuscitate that moral contract that is so crucial to our American democracy. And we ask, you know, we, we have questions that we ask and we bring out, but we have to look at ourselves and our individual behavior and where our mental model lies. And then how does that reinforce power dynamics that don't, that exclude so many people from being part of what ultimately we're all going to have to be exposed to as a result of decisions being made. Um, we think that this, thinking of throwing away binders is something new, but we've been throwing away um, value, human value since the first votes landed on this continent. And I believe that all of us are, have been given a gift to be in a country that again, cultivates an ideology of democracy. And the goal with doing design as a movement building tool, it puts us as stewards of that democracy to activate a more forward thinking in how we create again, a more just and human, uh, inclusive human experience devoid of this human um, hierarchy of value. Thank you. My name is Adam Trott. I'm a local registered architect and community advocate, and I'm going to take some of what April just explained and apply it to what we're looking at here with the Bayfront Parkway. Um, basically, what you have is you have uh, a Department of Transportation, PennDOT, that is acting as an agent for local stakeholders and power brokers that want the highway. So you won't see those stakeholders and power brokers coming forward because they don't have to. Their agents are doing their work for them. PennDOT is doing a good job for what they're tasked to do. The problem is the task is not properly defined and executed for them to follow. And what I mean by that is when you read their purpose and needs statement, they talk about how important it is to connect the city to the bayfront to provide adequate and enhanced non vehicular linkage between downtown and the bayfront. But then you look at their solution and the, the purpose and needs got a little too complicated for their, for their capacity to do this design solution. And we are talking about this is a design solution that we're looking for. So what they did is they resigned themselves to what they always do and do most efficiently and most cost effectively. And that's designing how to move more cars faster and how can we do that and keep the cost as contained as possible. So everything you've seen from PennDOT to date is a traffic engineer's answer to the purpose and needs statement. And those traffic engineers are not trained for urban design, bike, pedestrian linkages, the human aspect of what they're doing. They're trained to, to um, resolve the traffic aspect. So everything they've shown you is traffic oriented. And in contrast, what we presented in the Erie Reader is a more human centric 
design resolution. And the process that brought PennDOT to where they're proposing today has always been guided by a tightly controlled agenda of meetings and uh, those meetings were controlled. The agenda was controlled, the flow was controlled, and the after reporting was, con was controlled by, by the project team. So we end up with what we have. It's an incomplete design solution. It's very heavy on moving more cars faster. It's extremely subservient and by PennDOT's own admission in the op-ed in Sunday's paper, they're very concerned with regional flow of things in and out of the city. That is completely ignoring the city's connection to our precious waterfront. So what we're talking about is we need to reboot the process, take where it's gotten to today, and that's the traffic part. But the whole big missing part of the design solution, which is the city's connection, and the human centric treatment of this project is where it needs to go now. And so far, it looks like they're going to play the card that, geez, we've done all this work, it's inevitable, you know, get out of our way. No, we, we have to stand in front and say, no, you have to do this right. So for us moving forward, we, we need to redefine it to get it going on the right process and the public hearing that city council has now made a resolution to require, that's a big step in getting the right voices to the table. I am very pleased to be here. My name is Judy Lynch. Uh, I am a former county executive of Erie County. I served in that office from 1982 to 2002. Um, what my purpose is here is to give you a short history of the Bayfront Highway, but it is not the Bayfront Highway. The correct name of it is the Bayfront Parkway. And I think that's an extraordinary difference that we need to uh, uh, understand and to pay attention to. So uh, may I start? Um, this I have kind of written down, so I'm going to be reading it very quickly, but I'd be happy to share it with anybody. Uh, so the origins, the origins of the Bayfront P Parkway lie, of course, as you know, in the Interstate Highway Act. And that was passed in 1956 during the Eisenhower administration. And at the time, the Interstate Highway Act was the largest public works project ever adopted. Now, the first interstate highway that came our way was I-90. It linked Erie with Cleveland in, in uh, the west and Buffalo in the east. I-90 stretches 3,101 miles and is the longest interstate highway in the United States. The Erie portion is about 46.4 miles, and it was completed in 1958. Although I-90 was part of the Federal Interstate Highway Program, it was funded uh, by the Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission. Now, uh, another interstate highway came our way, and that was I-79. And the northern corridor, the northern corridor of Interstate 79 is called the Raymond P. Schaefer Highway after Pennsylvania governor from Crawford County. It was begun in 61 and it was finally completed to Erie in 1976. It linked Northwestern Pennsylvania directly to Pittsburgh and the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Now, what is so important is the result of the confluence of Interstate 90 and 79 near Peach Street is referred to as the Peach Street Corridor. Uh, concurrent with building of Interstates 90 and 79 was the provision of city water. And so a very, very savvy Mayor Lou Tulio and a real estate developer named Bob Baldwin first moved city water to the Baldwin Industrial Park and then to the site of the Mill Creek Mall and eventually further up uh, Peach Street, 
resulting in the rapid commercialization and development of the Peachtree Corridor. Of course, of course, the missing piece in the interstate thoroughfare was the Bayfront Parkway, which opened in 1990, connecting I-79 and I-90 to Erie's iconic Bayfront. The Bayfront Parkway made possible the development of Erie's prime asset, its prime asset, the Bayfront, which eventually featured the Maritime Museum, the restored Niagara, the Blasco Library, the Bayfront Convention Center, the Sheraton, the Marriott, the Cobblestone Inn, and now the Hampton Inn and Suite, and the Intermodal Center, among many other uh, areas. At the foot, at the foot of State Street, on the Bayfront, is the site of Erie's hallmark memorial, the Bicentennial Tower. Now clearly, clearly, as you can see, government investment in transportation during the 20th century is still paying dividends in the 21st century. By 2014, according to the article, Tourism, visitors in Erie in the Erie Times News, May 25th, 2014, and 2005, visitors spent $5.6 million during the month of July to rent rooms in Erie. Today, tourism is a multi-billion dollar industry in Erie County. That growth, that growth would not have happened without the highways. Interstate 90 completed in 1960 and Interstate 79 completed in 1976. And the Bayfront Parkway completed in the 1990s. They were responsible for this growth. Along with the elected officials of Erie County, it was the Erie Conference. And so you heard Adam re refer to the movers and shakers who are often behind the scenes. And it was the Erie Conference that served in that category. And it led the way to the construction of these highways. Two leaders probably should be mentioned. One is Benson F. Lechner, who was the president of the Erie Conference, and also Thomas Hoffman, who became the executive director of the conference. They, along with the elected officials, secured state approval and state funds for construction of what is now the Bayfront Parkway, not the Bayfront Highway, the Bayfront Parkway. By 1995, it was clear Erie's leaders had created a stunning parkway not a highway. There is a difference between a highway and a parkway. The parkway is a pleasant interlude bringing visitors and residents through gorgeous terrain. In this instance, Erie's Bayfront. And in 1995, the name of the connector became the Bayfront Parkway. Gone was the name Bayfront Highway and the concept of the Bayfront Highway. That was in 1995. These leaders made the intentional decision to change the name from the Bayfront Highway to the Bayfront Parkway. They also helped lead the way to securing one missing link, a connection from the Bayfront Highway to I-90 on Erie's east side. Again, Erie organized. Erie's political leaders and development groups like the Erie Conference played the political game. They lobbied successfully for the state financing for the East Side Connector. The first link of the East Side Connector from the Parkway to East 6th Street opened in December 1998 with the remaining sections completed soon thereafter. Completion of the Bayfront Parkway East and West was the crowning achievement of Erie's political officials of Tom Hoffman and the Erie Conference. Tom was honored for his role in 2013 when the park and ride at the west end of the parkway was named after him. Tom, Tom's no longer with us, nor is the Erie Conference. In 2002, the conference merged with the Erie Area Chamber of Commerce and eventually morphed into the current Erie Regional Chamber and Growth Partnership, one of our leading uh, advocates of the highway. 
in essence, the conference and elected officials of the 1990s, of the 1990s, had accomplished their goal, connecting Erie to the larger world through transportation corridors. In doing so, they built the intersection of I-79 and I-90, which eventually became the site of Presque Isle Downs and Casino. They brought about fantastic new development on the Peach Street Corridor, and they developed Erie's prime asset, the Bayfront. Now, now the leaders, both the political leaders and those who stand behind them, okay, and call the shots sometimes. Now these leaders of today are called to build on those accomplishments and connect and connect the people of the city of Erie to their Bayfront through imaginative, inviting corridors that allow pedestrians and bikers to intersect with tourists from around the world, collective, uh, collectively partaking of the Bayfront stunning beauty and its amenities, as well as providing an invitation and easy access for all into the center of the city of Erie. It is time to call people who are in leadership capacity back to the original dream and produce a parkway and not a highway. Freda Tepfer, and I'm an orientation and mobility specialist. And I also have years of experience with the National Environmental Policy Act from my work um, in the US Forest Service and in Snohomish County, Washington State. So I'm very familiar with um, the difference between an environmental assessment um, so my first year in Erie, I lived on Second and Poplar, and I used to walk every single one of the, um, the, the uh, docks along the bayfront. I ended up with a seven mile round trip walk from my house down and up and all around. Actually, I found out later I'd been missing the one at the Water Authority. So I'm really familiar with walking along the bayfront. I, I moved here to, to um, help people who are blind and visually impaired travel safely. And I, I have a great concern and appreciation for um, the ability of people with disabilities to get, a, get, a, get around. I think I'm, I'm, am I making an echo because I'm on in another machine? So I'm gonna just turn that off, forgive me a moment. Um, so on the surface, it might be nice to have a narrower intersection at State Street, and that would be more pedestrian friendly. However, to produce that result at the expense of living over a busy, busy highway, it's not a good trade-off. But that's what we're being asked to accept. We're being asked to say, well, this is a, a shorter crossing, so it's better for pedestrians, but there's more traffic. In fact, some of the documents I was reading today is there's going to be a lot more truck traffic. This is not actually a road that is bringing people to the bayfront, it's bringing people through the bayfront to get them around. And we never asked for that. We, we asked to get to the Bayfront. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to, to, to extract the pictures, but so, so we have a, um, a lid proposed over State Street with um, a shorter intersection, but they're also proposing to have um, on, right with a pedestrian overpass, which is currently not funded and other pedestrian overpasses at Sassafras and Holland, and not, none of which are funded. But if you look at the picture uh, of them, and I could not find them today, they're, they're enclosed. Um, I would feel totally unsafe and intimidated walking in an enclosed overpass. I use the overpass between the Sheraton and the convention center sometimes, but I feel a little nervous being in there. And I cannot imagine anybody feeling safe using those overpasses. 
Now the, the, the path that goes down from Liberty, that's an open pathway and that's actually a very nice way to get down to the Bayfront and it is accessible. Another concern, so another concern I have which wasn't evaluated is how much more pollutants are we gonna be breathing with all this additional traffic and all this additional truck, truck traffic? It was never evaluated. The only air quality evaluation was what they call conformance data, macro scale versus micro scale data of ozone in the entire area. But we're looking at the micro scale of what is the impact of the person walking along the bayfront, residing at, uh, near the bayfront or visiting and staying in the hotels. Um, give me a, like a one minute when I have a one minute, Lisa, okay. Um, and um, Also, one thing that is going to disappear is the ability to have what we call a controlled crossing of Holland Street, because there's going to be a roundabout to get you across the Bayfront Parkway, but to actually get across Holland Street, there's no controlled crossing, no stoplight. Right now, there is a stoplight at the Bayfront Parkway in Holland, but if somebody wants to walk across Holland, there's no controlled intersection. And with all the increased traffic coming from the developments of the Scott developments, and there's a, it's already an issue, but, but that uncontrolled intersections are really a problem for people who are visually impaired. So um, this is not really good pedestrian access, um, improved pedestrian access. It's, um, it's sort of better pedestrian access, but sacrificing the actual quality of the experience. And that's how I would evaluate it. Thanks, Freda. I think this is a, <clears throat> a good segue into uh, my piece. My name is Roland Slade, and I am a video collage artist, a uh, activist, and a uh, social critic. I'm also the media director of Connect Urban Erie. Um, I put together a piece that really speaks for the community. Um, I believe that all the voices pretty much said that this is something that um, this Bayfront uh, expansion is something that the city uh, doesn't need um, and the people really don't want. Um, the city of Erie has been uh, notorious for um, not listening to the voice of the people. So while we want to move forward with speaking on this project, I just thought we would allow some of the voices who spoke on a previous project um, where we were speaking loud and bold of do not tear down this bridge. And that is the, McV the McBride Viaduct. Um, many of the people on this panel today was involved in that project. Um, so what we did was is a, it's a collaboration piece um, with me um, Adam and Lisa and several others that uh, 90 second small documentary that we put together. Um, we also entered it in a AIA challenge um, that speaks to many of these issues. Um, and I just wanted to take this time to show you that piece. And we should save this bridge. Keep it. I think they should keep it. So I don't think you guys should break the bridge down. No one wouldn't want no one to destroy it or nothing. Just save the E5 bridge trying to save the bridge. I think we should save the bridge. Like, we need this bridge. Everybody wants this bridge. Y'all need to keep it open. Oh, we out here. We trying to save this bridge. Keep the bridge here. We don't want you to tear it down. We need to bring this bridge back. I don't believe it should be torn down. So please, keep the bridge open. The McBride Viaduct was a bridge over the railroad tracks. The viaduct connected East Side Erie. The red line neighborhoods around the viaduct are some of the most diverse and impoverished in the United States. Lacking urban design sensitivity, City Hall focused on managing Erie's decline rather than leveraging opportunities like the viaduct. Protecting their flawed process, City Hall blocked a public hearing, ignored residents' pleas, and dismissed advice from a dozen experts, including Michael Kimmelman of the New York Times. The animation shows great traffic engineering, but it's not urban design. We need a process that includes all stakeholders and results in a design for all modes of travel, including motor vehicles, 
bicyclists, pedestrians, people using wheelchairs, and even residents walking their dogs. Don't give up our bayfront, build a boulevard. And that was, <laughs> that was just a few voices. We had, in that time period that we were filming, we had, um, I think, somewhere around 50 people stop and, and speak their voice. Um, hundreds of others um, went off the record. Um, and what we're trying to do as Connect Urban Erie is allow the people's voice to be heard on this project. Many times the city does not listen to what the people have to say. So when city council stepped up and, and demanded or voted for a public hearing, it was almost brought tears to our eyes that they finally are starting to wake up. Right now, nationally, we are in a state where many people are sick and tired of being sick and tired. And many people, many municipalities are waking up to listening to the people. We want the city of Erie to do that as well. We don't wanna go backwards. We want to stop this old uh, boys club of decision makings, like Adam said, behind the scene, and allow the people's voice to be heard. We have many, many people who love the city, who walk around in the downtown area and walk down to the Bayfront. Even myself, for the last week and a half, me and my wife have been walking all along that area, um, down to the pier, um, up along uh, uh, West 2nd Street, um, down by the, the water, um, uh, this, uh, water Authority. And it's just so beautiful to look at. We don't want that to go away. So please listen to the people and uh, stop this bayfront. Thank you. Hello, my name is Simone. Thank you, Roland. Thank you, Lisa, for making this possible. And for everyone that's taken a moment to lend voice to this concern. Um, I'm a, an artist and a writer. Um, but uh, in this space, I am a local citizen of Erie, local resident um, with a vested interest in making this city uh, more amenable uh, to serving the needs of people who look like me for my sake and for the sake of my children and uh, my neighbors. So I'll be reading uh, a thought piece that I wrote in response to uh, the, the current proposal um, entitled Who Benefits by PennDOT's Plan. Um, and the short answer is those who are seeking vehicle, with vehicles seeking to bypass the city. How does such a mundane point relate to this discussion? With an estimate of more than 10,000 vehicles a day to be served by this plan, Erie would better be served in addressing the community surrounding this proposed build. The people living in zip codes li that, who live in socioeconomic conditions that rank these areas among the most underserved are also the people that we need to address when we think of this plan. In these communities where less than half of the residents have vehicles, their local destinations will most certainly not be more accessible as a result of this proposal. The more than 10,000 vehicles a day expected to use this throughway would seek to bypass the city, bypassing both its community resources and its economic offerings. Furthermore, the communities that currently already experience the consequences of such previous builds in Erie's east neighborhoods have unresolved foot traffic access, access to parts of their own community space and to the greater city. Many still must climb the structures that border the Bayfront Highway and navigate by foot across a shoulderless thoroughfare where vehicles often drive at speeds in excess of 50 or 60 miles per hour. Many residents without vehicles must cross the highway by foot, or oh, I'm sorry, by foot, and without even these needs being re remaining unaddressed by former promises of pedestrian overpass builds, how then do the residents in the community surrounding these proposed highways gain the pedestrian safety that PennDOT claims to be primarily serving? In truth, the plan is designed to serve its unnamed goal of increasing vehicle traffic through the city and destined elsewhere. So the people without vehicles seeking passage to local destinations in the city, as well as the people who live in the city with vehicles, who are also hopeful that this plan will yield a mo more robust economy, are not actually served in this proposal. What are the community outcomes of these types of eminent domain plans? 
Most of these city highways have been constructed through economically depressed areas where the land was depreci depreciated and more easily able to be bought. These economic depressed zones are primarily populated by low-income people as well as people of color across the economic spectrum from below poverty level to upper middle class black and brown people and new Americans. Redlining practices in Erie, much like redlining across the nation, has refused home purchase and home improvement loans to people based upon their perceived ethnic backgrounds. By profiling particular zip codes and family surnames, or even conjecturing based on an applicant's given name, banks in this city have routinely refused loans and services to people of color, causing, to, causing them to buy or rent cheaper property in more densely populated areas. This crowding often becomes the underlying factor in increased crime rates. That factor along with the high population density of low income individuals and families providing little property taxes to their municipalities causes underfunding in a public education and low high school graduation rates. The low school graduation rates and the poorly funded schooling lead to limited job opportunities. This pressure cooker of a situation leads to economically suppressed zones with depreciated land and property becoming the primary targets of eminent domain building, build proposals. These circumstances leave these neighborhoods divided or cordoned off due to highway builds running through their sections of the city. To add further insult to injury, the very communities that were raised to make room for public thoroughfares are often walled off from those thoroughfares, as is the case in Erie's East Bayfront Connector, when new commercial properties are built to be accessible by vehicular traffic through the highway. The actual community that houses, houses both the roadway and the commercial establishments are neatly walled off from accessing, accessing those establishments meaning both their jobs and their services are not accessed. Redlining hurts the community that is directly invaded by the loss of housing, but it also hurts those communities by barring them from access to the greater metropolis and its resources. This lack of access hurts everyone though, not just the people living behind those walls. Without the ability to access jobs and services, without access to the greater city, with only access to the limited jobs within their own communities, people in these economically depressed areas cannot thrive. They cannot effectively sustain their own communities without greater um, public tax dollars. The undue stress could be remedied by one, ending the economic redlining practices that intentionally suppress the land values. Two, not building highways or traffic structures that separate these communities from the greater city. And three, providing actual safe pedestrian and cyclist access to city centers and cross city destinations. Only building pedestrian bridges or more foot traffic access to points on the East Bayfront, Bayfront connector will not end this type of crisis for our city, but it is a good start in a better direction. We need to also stop further harm to these already marginalized, disenfranchised and cordoned off neighborhoods of our city by legitimately addressing how plans like the PennDOT proposal will affect the surrounding communities. We need a full NEPA assessment to, in the very least, learn the following. How will the expanded volume of vehicle traffic affect the water and air quality of the residents and the wildlife? How will the increased emissions impact the people, the land, and the animals in the space? How is the quality of life for all involved diminished by the massive concrete structure? What impact will it have on already rising water levels? Will it cause further housing displacement as a result of environmental impacts, as well as potential economic impacts that are previously described? How can an already vulnerable and struggling community be better served, better supported? By the joint awareness of the greater community and the joint accountability of our elected officials and holding true to their charge to serve the public. We here are the voice for the voiceless, those of us presenting and those of us listening. We are the bridge back to the community and how we navigate this juncture as a city, as fellow residents and as neighbors living in this beautiful space together. Thank you for letting me read that and share this time. Simone, I thought that was 
uh, a lot of thought that went into that. It was uh, excellent. And Dr. Lynch, of course, you were the county executive when the Bayfront Highway first started back in 1989. And you're right, it did change in 1995 when Governor Ridge uh, became Premier, he became our governor. Uh, April, that was very informative. And I think, you know, people like you that have these type of organizations really need to have a seat at the table. I think you're absolutely right with it. I found it to be very fascinating. Uh, and of course, Sarah, I thought, you know, uh, we are uh, our water, right? That's who we are as a community. We are connected. Our whole identity is tied up with our water. What better way to spend our time and our, our money to preserve that water, especially for uh, generations to come. I'm not sure what I can add uh, to what uh, has already been said. I think, um, you know, as you said, Dr. Uh, Lynch, you know, if it wasn't for PennDOT uh, building the Bayfront Parkway, then we would not have the amenities along the waterfront that we have. We wouldn't have that beautiful bike ride that I ran into you, Adam, from Penn State Barron coming across the southern, the southern shore of our bay. Um, so there are great amenities that have happened to that. Um, and in many ways, that highway has brought also uh, an opportunity for us to reinvent ourselves as a city. As we see the development of that waterfront in, a, in an extraordinary way, those of us who live uh, particularly in the urban core ask ourselves, why can't we connect with that? And as we know, um, Many years ago, there was a master plan, a comprehensive plan that was done by the city called Erie Refocused. And it talked about these connections. Uh, now the Bayfront Parkway has brought many good things, but is it perfect? Absolutely not. We all know that, and even PennDOT knows that. In fact, it's the glaring two problems that it was designed in a way that fostered people to drive too fast, that has left innumerable people injured and uh, accidents, and have left dozens of people to die on our parkway. Uh, that's unacceptable. The other reason is that the parkway acts as a, a dangerous and very unpleasant barricade for those of us who want to walk across it, or anybody to walk across it. So for those two reasons, we asked PennDOT to reconsider making improvements on that uh, parkway to reduce the speed, make it safe, and to allow the people that are living in the urban core to have access to the amenities that are right in front of us. But crossing that thoroughfare is just too dangerous and unpleasant. So we were very ho hopeful that when we read the reports that they espoused the very essence of Erie Refocus, which is core strengthening, to develop the core in a way that the heart is pulsating vitality throughout the community. This was very encouraging. Um, unfortunately, we don't always see that happening in our plan, um, but we do see that in the city. We took to heart what Buki has said, strengthen the core as we define it, the Bayfront, the downtown, our east and west neighborhoods. We see that happening today. The city has taken that very seriously. The Erie Downtown Development Corporation, for example, is pounding millions of dollars into a footprint along uh, uh, State Street and Fifth, trying to kind of recapture the glory of, of living downtown. This is a good testimony. Our West Bayfront uh, has a wonderful plan, driven a lot by Ghana University, that's designed to re reinvigorate that wonderful neighborhood on the East Bayfront. And it's happening. We can see it. And on our east side, in relationship to uh, Erie Insurance and uh, Best and Serve Erie, there's great improvements along that east, uh, lower east side area with the flipping of the armory and uh, you know, Erie Insurance trying to create housing for the consideration of their employees to live in the downtown. And that to me is ultimately the goal here. How do we create a downtown, an urban core, that is vibrant and that attracts all different types of people to consider to live in the urban core and to create a density that is a prerequisite for rejuvenation. We don't need just to become an evening 
college night. We don't need just to become a workplace. We need people, diverse people, to live in the urban core. And as I pointed out, that's happening. What's not happening, and we can clearly see, and I think this is why we're here, is that we don't what see those doing? connections. A big pardon? Why y'all throwing that stuff in the creek? So, so we don't see these connections uh, between the downtown and the waterfront in a way that um, that the bison that, that the, uh, uh, the the master plan asked for. So what I'd like to do is just spend a couple minutes looking very carefully at what they are proposing, what PennDOT is proposing. And I think a lot of it is, is on the right track and a lot of it is not on the right track. My question is, if we look at the Bayfront Parkway, we can identify that by their own numbers, that the high mortality rate happens in, as you pointed out, Simone, on the East Bayfront Parkway. It happens around 12th, 12th Street down to about 6th Street. This is the highest mortality rate of people dying on our highway or our parkway. And incidentally, that strip of the highway came six years later than the west side of the, the uh, parkway. So it's actually more fatalities in a shorter period of time. And if we look to the western part of our Bayfront connector, by Green Garden and Lincoln and West 8th, we see almost the second highest mortality rate. So if indeed the roundabouts, which are scheduled to be dual lanes, which is the size of about a football field, profess to actually, and they do, reduce mortality rate in crashes up to 70%, why wouldn't we consider moving these bayfront or these park or these uh, roundabouts to the areas in which we have the high mortality rates? This is the big, this is a serious question. So we know that. In our plan, Buki calls for an iconic connection, and PennDOT's going to spend up to 21 to $22 million at State Street by having the parkway run north-south underneath it and State Street over it. I think we can all agree that it's not going to be an iconic connection, but it is a very utilitarian and, by and large, not a bad idea, and I think we all can agree with that, right? I think, generally speaking. So you have your two bayfront, you have your two uh, uh, roundabouts in an area where, quite frankly, you're not going to have the crashes that are statistically recorded there right now. In fact, State Street is considered one of the highest spots of crashes uh, in the past five years. There's been 40 crashes there. If we don't have a stoplight there, the crashes will be essentially eliminated unless you're on top. And two, you won't have that idle time that as causes that congestion. So my question is, and I think this ties into why we need to have a little bit more discussion about where that plan is. Is there a possibility where we can take those Bayfront or those roundabouts and move them into areas where they need to be and then create pedestrian overpasses at Holland and if necessary at, at Sassafras or even further down, preferably in Cherry or Lincoln, or I'm sorry, or uh, Liberty Street to connect into Liberty Park. So that this is, these are a little bit more in the weeds question. Um, but I think it's worth consideration to think about what would that parkway look like if the roundabouts weren't there or they were in areas where the higher mortality rate was and it was a slower uh, parkway, one that wasn't such a threat to people to cross them. Then I think we start to look at the perspective of if we can land these bayfront, uh, these pedestrian bridges in these neighborhoods, it provides an incentive for that neighborhood to take advantage of the amenities along the waterfront. And that would actually increase the idea of investing in these neighborhoods because families want to, people want to have connection with our water. It's right in front of us. We need to have access to enjoy that. You know, in some ways, PennDOT's in a really tough position. We've asked them to fix the problems of a fast highway, and I think they're addressing it. And we can agree with that. We've also asked them to give us an iconic connection with very little resources. So what I mean by that is Erie has not stepped up to participate in this. There's no skin in the game in a sense, whether it's county, city government, whether it's our businesses, whether it's our institution of learning or higher ed, we really have not stepped up and said, PennDOT, we would like to have something, some sort of an iconic connection that would be a, a civic pride kind of thing, and that we're really to have skin in the game in this. We haven't 
hadn't done that. So in some ways, it's difficult for PennDOT uh, in their situation. However, as was identified before, perhaps through a series of connections along the parkway and the beautification of it and attracting pedestrians and, and bikers along the, the parkway, that in itself becomes the iconic connection that we all can be proud of. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Gary Orton. Uh, the focus of my, com my comments are don't give up our Bayfront. Um, I currently serve as the president of the local branch of the NAACP. I serve as uh, one of the coordinators of the Eastside Grassroots Coalition. I also serve as the director of the Urban Erie Community Development Corporation and I serve on the Governor's Advisory Board for Environmental Justice. I've lived on the West Bay front uh, half of my life. I learned perseverance and fighting uh, for people from my parents, Howard and Mildred Horton, and their influence in our neighborhood. Uh, my father was born and raised in Erie in the 1920s. My family has been in Erie since the 19 teens. Uh, my father was born in a house on the bluff on the east side above the bay. Um, the discussion that we're having this evening about Erie's Bayfront and who has access to it is deeply tied to the history of Erie. Uh, most of you are likely familiar with the basic story of the role of the flagship Niagara in the War of 1812 on the Battle of Lake Erie at the helm by Captain or, or uh, Oliver Hazard Perry, Commodore Al Oliver Hazard Perry. He adopted the dying words of his friend Captain James Lawrence, don't give up the ship as their personal mantra. When Perry's own ship, the Lawrence, was nearly destroyed, he pulled off a surprise victory by, making, by quickly making his way to the largely unscathed Niagara and returned fire on the British fleet so fiercely that the battle was over in 15 minutes. Some of you might know that many of the sailors under that command of Perry were black former slaves and freedmen. These, slave, these sailors fought valiantly with honor. The name of the Niagara has significance in another reason, the Niagara Movement. It was a civil rights group founded in 1905 near Niagara Falls by a scholar and activist W.E.B. Du Bois when he gathered with 28 supporters on the Canadian side of the Niagara Falls because they were not allowed to stay in the hotels on the American side, to form an organization dedicated to the social and political uh, change for African Americans. Its list of demands included an end to segregation and discrimination in unions, the courts, public accommodations and transportation, as well as equality of economic and educational opportunity. The ideals of the Niagara Movement, as set forth by Du Bois, helped form the basis of the creation of the National Association of the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, along with what occurred in 1908 in Illinois about a mass riot uh, that was rocked in, uh, in, um, in Springfield, Illinois, the capital. Uh, such eruptions of anti-Black violence, particularly lynching, were horrifically commonplace. But the Springfield riot was the tipping point that led to the creation of the NAACP. What does that have to do with today? It seems like there's a, we're rehashing a lot of the same, same issues. We carry on the fight for racial and economic equity today, environmental justice, is just as critical. People of color have been relegated through redlining and planning to, and discrimination to neighborhoods with the highest pollution, often cut off from the rest of the population by ill-conceived highways like the East Side Connector. People who come into the city to work from outlying areas prefer to avoid these neighborhoods. They want to get to work and get home without interacting with city residents. But what we know from a pile of studies is that segregation by race is tied to economic segregation. It holds down the whole population when segregation is entrenched. We have along the Bayfront, uh, along State Street, uh, where it intersects with the, as a, 
former county exec Judy Lynch said with the uh, Bayfront Parkway, they want to turn State Street into a highway. They want to bypass and cut off Dobbins, Dobbins Lane. They want to uh, uh, make even more insignificant the uh, Underground Railroad. Uh, it's like uh, Attorney Ben Crump said today when the African-American young man was shot in Wisconsin in front of his children seven times in the back. It's deliberate indifference. That's what categorical exclusion is. You know, so it calls for eliminating uh, the uh, environmental assessment, uh, uh, which should also include an environmental justice assessment. Uh, because the NAACP is, uh, and the local NAACP is seeking the partnership with Earth Justice and Connect Erie and any of the other uh, of uh, speakers that have been on our call tonight because we believe joined together, the ants ate the elephant. Uh, 102 years, this, is, is this organization in Erie, which was founded in 1918, is 102 years old. And the fact that we're still suffering the effects of redlining and exclusion and deliberate indifference says it all. We cannot give up the ship. We cannot give up the road, the highway, or the uh, the street. This this uh, condition of the of the health uh, uh, inequities that we are uh, under uh, that we're under the influence of with the health pandemic. When you look at the in economic injustice and the social injustice, along with criminal injustice and environmental injustice, we have every reason to collaborate, to organize, to join together, to unify, to do Perry's old battle cry, don't give up the street, don't give up our right of way to the Niagara. And so that's, that's my calling by, while I'm interested uh, as the president of this organization to hitch our wagon to your horse so that we can stand tall in the face of uh, this, uh, um, again, what did he call it? Uh, deliberate indifference so that we might take, make a change in Erie today. Again, I wanna thank Li uh, Lisa, I wanna thank Adam, I wanna take, thank Roland and Simone, I thank Judy Lynch, I wanna thank all of you uh, that are outside Erie that uh, think it not uh, uh, above you uh, to lend your support to our efforts in our community. And that we, we, we suffered a loss with the tearing down the bridge and the significant impact it had in our community. But with your support and with your prayers, I believe that we will win this battle as we don't give up our uh, access to the, to, the, uh, to the waterfront, the people's access to the waterfront. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Horton. Um, it's a pretty impossible to follow that one up because I've just been asked to offer alternative uh, ideas to that, so, or to the PennDOT plan. So um, thank you again for that, it was powerful. Um, all right, my name is Maxwell Hentosh. I'm an architectural and urban designer from Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and I was actually a part of the CUDC design group that worked with the Jefferson Education Center um, to kind of create this public focused version of the PennDOT Bayfront plan, which was released a little over a year, a year ago now. Um, really quick, a little bit about me. I spent um, several years and received two master's degrees in architecture and urban design. And my focus throughout school was always um, like human design and environmental design. Um, all of the projects that I had always had a predominant water element. So this Erie project, you know, is very similar to a lot of what I've studied. Um, I wanted to start with kind of a warning. I'm a Cleveland native and we actually have a highway that divides the urban center w from Lake Erie. And it has created this massive barrier that most people never want to transcend, um, very literally dividing the waterfront from wow. where people are living. Um, it's a lake uh, front shoreway, four lane highway. And like I said, the public that lives inland 
finds it very difficult to access the actual waterfront from the like constructed urban core. Um, this is now a significant challenge that Cleveland is trying to uh, battle and the uh, I, the number one idea proposed has been a multi-million dollar land bridge that goes over the highway that was constructed um, trying to put a band-aid on the wound that was inflicted here in Cleveland. Um, and so I was asked to discuss better alternatives. You know, there's been a number of cities that have very strong connections to the waterfront, such as Chicago, New York, Seattle, the list goes on. Um, but instead, I'd rather discuss uh, two towns, cities that um, are our neighbors and have a very successful waterfront connection, giving the public of Erie something to think about, um, maybe some design process to work off of. Um, so the number one that I'd like to start with is Lakewood which is a town adjacent to Cleveland. And they've realized the strength of constructing a massive public park that overlooks Lake Erie with a, a large stair that is now socially distanced, um, but packed with people um, on summer nights that people will gather there for sunset. Uh, there's a number of entertainment venues and restaurants. Um, and it's really just a genuine public space that's very easily accessible to the people of Lakewood. Um, and on a larger scale, Cincinnati uh, has a mile long park with restaurants, entertainment venues, uh, live music facilities, and um, family, fr family friendly events all year long um, that draws massive crowds. Um, so th these two closer to home projects that I would like the uh, Erie people to consider, um, at least looking at, uh, have shared two things in common. And one is that they understand how much public space and human uh, access uh, adjacent to waterfront really brings a community together and builds them up. But two, there's no barriers, there's no highway that divides these spaces from the people and the waterfront there. Um, and I really think having any sort of say against PennDOT's plan um, is vital for uh, the Erie people because I don't believe that PennDOT's plan is the solution that you're looking for, especially if you're looking for an iconic connection that'll connect the public to the waterfront. I'm gonna keep it short and that's it, but thank you. Thank you all, uh, Lisa and Adam, and, uh, Sarah and all who are uh, rolling on. And of course, uh, the incomparable Dr. Lynch. That's always good to see you, Simone, mm -hmm. uh, Mike, and I want. I, my mother told me I should never start calling names, but really I was just working to my brother. Thank you all for giving me an opportunity to actually see my brother. We're both so busy, we rarely see each other. Uh, but indeed, thank you all for putting on this uh, webinar. It, it is a very important topic. It's a topic that's dear to me. Uh, my brother, I, I can't out talk him, uh, but uh, we did grow up on the bluff, on the lower west bluff. And my father, uh, I actually live in the house that my dad uh, lived in since he was five years old on the east bluff. Sixty-five percent of the people over on the east bluff, on the east side, do not have driver's license. Uh, they've come up with a term called food desert. Uh, but in biblical times, I believe they called it famine. And there is no supermarket below 26th Street, either on the east or the west bluff. Uh, I have the dubious distinction of being a 33-year member of Labor's Local 603, and I've worked on every phase of the Bayfront Connector. I've worked on the 79 Exchange. Um, I've worked on State Street. Uh, they were remo removing the tracks or re relocating them, uh, or I mean tearing off the asbestos. And I worked on that dangerous portion uh, from 12th Street to 6th Street. Um, and I'm here to tell you that it. Uh, I agree with Simone. You uh, in, in your uh, you were very eloquent uh, in in your comments, and they, and as Mike said, they were very well thought out and. They were factual and on point. Um, I'm embarrassed that I worked on uh, on that. You know, as my children 
ride around like my dad before me was a laborer. He says, I worked on this, I worked on that, I worked on this. But when I see what has happened uh, to the East Bay front and how it's been decimated, uh, how commerce has been driven around it, uh, uh, even to the point of the McBride by a duck um, and what it meant to the East Side, I watched how all the cul-de-sac roads uh, uh, appeared on all the odd streets. Uh, because I am a laborer, I'm familiar with the very, very wide aprons at 12th, at 6th, at State Street. And even I say at Holland, it's not as wide, but wide nonetheless, and certainly not pedestrian friendly. Uh, I watch as I leave my home uh, in the mornings during the school, and I can't make a left turn uh, because cars are trying to avoid the traffic and the congestion that's already on the Bayfront Highway. Uh, and, and if I can't make a left turn, children can't cross the street to even get to the bus stop. I actually know someone who was killed in a wheelchair, uh, Freda, crossing. She may have been the first person, uh, one of the early ones killed. Uh, I was a friend of mine, uh, was killed uh, at 6th in, uh, in our Bayfront. I do remember walking down the hill when it used to be uh, pedestrian friendly, when my siblings and I, my, our loved ones, our friends, our neighbors, all who lived in uh, uh, New Jerusalem, which is iconic all in itself, uh, how we went to Chestnut Pool on Girls' Day and Boys' Day because there was no co-ed uh, swimming. Uh, and and I, I watched how at the foot of Walnut, there was a, la a walkway, a stairwell that we could walk down uh, from Walnut to the waterfront. Uh, I walked there uh, at the, uh, of the other end of the park, which is Pontiac Field and Jethro Field now. Also, there were stairs. Uh, uh, it was so accessible. They had the drainage ditches. Uh, and those of us who, uh, when we couldn't go to Frontier Park, we rode cardboard down those drainage ditches to, yep, you guessed it, uh, to the waterfront. Uh, and we were easily uh, accessible uh, to us. Uh, I watched my grandfather uh, take his boat and launch it down there, uh, off there where they're now renting water schemes and how it's commercialized. And I'm watching the access uh, be diminished. Uh, you can do go down there by daytime, uh, but as each development goes up, the hotels go up, you got to be out of there by night or whatever. And uh, to me, that's uh, uh, the one of the most beautiful time to be down there near the water is at night. Uh, and so uh, I'm, I'm acutely uh, aware of, of what the Bayfront means and how it's divided and how it's directed commerce around the city. Uh, uh, people don't stop at the uh, Shell Station on 6th and Parade. Most people on the other side of Green Garden have no idea what goes on in the city outside of the negativity that they see in the newspaper. They have no idea of the many great citizens and people who live there and grow their gardens that may be even affected by the fumes uh, of, the, of the added 10,000 vehicles <laughs> that might come through there. Uh, uh, I, I talked about left turns on this side, on the uh, west side of the Bayfront Parkway uh, but also, if you're if you're on the south side of the Bayfront Parkway on over by East High School, you can't make a left and barely you can make a right uh, because the traffic is just horrendous. And uh, uh, I'm watching fast school buses all day long there, uh, and the traffic wasn't too long. But the the gist of it is is that I I thank you all for doing this because um, uh, from a legislative standpoint of view, um, um, with everything that's happened uh, in this short uh, 2020 season, uh, and I know this is going on from 2019, it's kind of hard to stay engaged without the residents like yourself uh, and uh, empower you, what you do as activists and concerned citizens and environmentalists, it, it, it really does uh, activate us as legislators. Uh, and in turn, we're able to empower you, uh, 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 as Ms. Lynch knows, uh, by, by uh, supporting uh, the things that uh, you, our constituents, put forward. Uh, I do 
uh, it, it, it's very dangerous crossing any of those streets as a for an adult, much less a child <laughs> or school age children at that. Uh, Sixty-five percent of the people over there, over here on the Lower East Side, don't even have driver's license, and so it, it's a horrible idea. And and I'm very familiar, um, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Brother Maxwell. I'm very familiar with Lake si Lakeside in, in Cleveland and how it's separated. Being a lifelong Cleveland Brown and a Cleveland Indian fan, and, and and seeing how you even have to walk over there on game day how it's very divisive and it's not even aesthetically nice at all. And it's dangerous. Uh, and so in my summation, uh, whatever you guys need me to do as a legislator, and, and it is not just as a, uh, a representative of other county, but the, as a representative of the Erie County second legislative district, which encompasses the Bayfront on both ends of it, uh, over by Lincoln, uh, which uh, I know someone who's died there also and stuff and so uh, uh and so from one end of the bayfront to the other uh mr Furman, i think you've always thought you were very very bright and astute and uh and a, and a thinker and i agree with you as in regards to the roundabouts being placed at the most dangerous or high impact areas it just makes sense uh but sometimes we around here in erie uh we uh, some i think the people in, in my neighborhood says it, it just sounds too much like right and Mr. Buki says we just have a way of doing stupid stuff. Uh, <laughs> so um, he chose another word. Uh, I'm trying to be uh, verbiage matters, <laughs> and so I'm, I'm trying to watch my vernacular. But but um, I'm supportive, uh, and I'm in favor of asking for uh, a, a uh, assessment, environmental assessment, uh, and the uh, and I disagree uh, with the uh, conclusion that PennDOT. <laughs> this is without controversy uh, and I know that most of the people uh, nearer to the Bayfront who are being gentrified uh, Mike we have talk we have a difference of opinion on some of the EDDC stuff uh, I like some of what they're doing but we should be having the rent control talk too because the bottom line is if you can't if you don't own if you're not owner down here you won't be able to live there and enjoy all of the things that we're fighting for now anyway so thank you all, uh, and please dial me in, keep me involved. Lisa, I owe you a huge debt uh, of gratitude uh, uh, for, for prodding me, um, and uh, I thank you for it. Uh, so thank you again. So my name is Andre Versado, for those of you who don't know me. Now, I'm not only here tonight as, um, you know, the founder of Erie Equal, I I'm here primarily as a concerned citizen um, and representing voices that could not make it tonight. Uh, now, Lisa tapped me, you know, a few weeks ago and brought this uh, this project to my attention, and she's just filled me with knowledge, you know, on the ramifications that could take place if we don't take this very seriously. This is something that is huge for our city, um, and not only our city alone, but all the, uh, you know, the citizens, the citizens that it will directly Im impact. Um, so, so my my number one priority right now is bringing attention to this matter. Um, and not only attention, but bringing action to this matter, because as many of you know, that if there's not action that's put behind the voices that do not approve of this, um, this is just going to get blown right through. Um, it's going to get approved with an overwhelming yes vote, and it's going to happen. So we all have to stand tall together and stay focused on what's really important, and that's, uh, you know, stopping this, this plan that the, you know, the PennDOT has in store for our Erie Bayfront and not giving up the Bayfront, which is a term that I, I really, really like. Thank you, Lisa, for coming up with that. So I only have a few minutes to speak, so I just really want to bring attention to the fact that Erie Equal, um, along with Lisa and other organizers, we are hosting an event on Wednesday of this week, and that event is going to be at 7 p.m. over at Dobbins Lane, right on the foot of State Street. That event starts at 7 p.m., and essentially what that event is going to be about is it's going to show the support that the community has um, standing in solidarity against this uh, project from taking place. So not only will they hear our voices, they will see our voices and they will feel our voices. Um, and I think that's very important that if everybody that's on this call, um, if they can't come themselves, if they just spread the word and bring everybody um, who's able body and able to be out there to stand with each other in support against this decision. I think that's all I have for tonight. Um, oh yeah, one final thing. So I got I got noticed that I will be on 
the live news on Thursday of this week at about 5 p.m. I would love if somebody on this call would be able to participate in that with me. Um, my email address, I will post that shortly in the comment section here. Uh, I just want somebody that's really, really knowledgeable on this project to join in on that, uh, to join in on that news conference with me so that they can spread attention, um, you know, to the masses in the Erie City. That's all I have for you guys tonight. Good evening to all of the panelists and to Adam, especially Adam and, and Lisa and this wonderful coalition of voices and uh, activism that have brought us to this Zoom. I want to first uh, thank you for the education I've received and, and uh, this wonderful presentation uh, that has come to us through the different voices from different fields of, of interest. And I just want to uh, piggyback on a, on a question that was raised by Simone, who benefits? And I think that that question really takes me to the doctrine of creation and uh, as a Christian and as a pastor, uh, I'm not the only person of faith that believes that there's something very sacred about creation. Uh, Jewish people believe that, Catholic people believe that, Muslims and the Universalists and, and so many others of, of spirituality believe that creation does not belong to a small percentage of people who act as gods or goddesses on behalf of everyone else. And yet that seems to be what has been happening um, since the dawn of American uh, democracy. And so as I listened attentively, uh, I kept saying to myself that uh, as much as things change, they continue to remain the same. And, and one of the reasons is because of the structure and those who control the narrative uh, are the same. And whoever controls the narrative, whoever controls the microphone, whoever controls media, they're the ones that get their narrative out. And so I'm just grateful that there is another uh, group of voices, another activism that is at work, and especially over the last 40, 50 years, and these alternative voices are making uh, great progress in changing the narrative of how democracy uh, will uh, continue in, in America. And, and right now, um, I, I'm thankful that, that you're on good ground uh, in terms of, of your push, because God was the first one that had a design on how things should look on earth. And, and therefore, there's a doctrine of creation that suggests uh, that God looked at everything that he thought should be made. And he, of course, made everything based on it being family friendly. Um, and so he did an environmental assessment. And, and after he did his environmental assessment, uh, God actually uh, graded himself. And his environmental assessment statement was simply, it is good. And so whatever we're doing lines up with the God who wants to see creation and every part of the earth be family friendly, individual friendly, and no person, no child, no adult, no one left behind when it comes to safety. People who benefit uh, most uh, are the people who should benefit the most, and that is the masses and not the elite. And every time I think about uh, my tenure here in Erie, I think about this third class citizenship that Erie has. And I think about how people who have first class uh, status look at cities with third class status as though they're slaves or indentured servants. And I just want to remind everybody on this call that even though Erie's a third class city, uh, Erie has first class intelligence, first class brilliance. And just keep on the ballot the very things that the elite uh, don't want on the ballot. And that is compassion, uh, that is uh, love for those whose voices are not as loud or as articulate as others and keep on the ballot of the sacredness of every human being, keep on the ballot, the worth 
worthwhileness, the worthiness of every human being. And all the work that uh, you all are doing, it really is the very work of God in so many different ways through so many different people. And so last but not least, I want to mention that as you go forward, and I'm, and I'm going to show my partisanship here, I watched the Democratic Convention and I watched the first night of the Republican Convention and it seems like I saw and heard and, and looked at two different cities or two different visions, two different ways forward. And I, I like what I saw on the first side because of the diversity and because of the people who would benefit when it comes to the question who benefits. And on the other vision, I saw uh, a family oriented uh, vision that protects the status quo and protects the way things have been as opposed to the way things should be. So keep up the good fight of faith. Um, visualize things based on your intelligence and the brilliance God has given you. And just remember that we don't always win the battle, but the winning is in the fighting. And we prove that with uh, the McBride Bridge. Even though we lost the bridge, we didn't lose the battle because the battle goes on even to this day. And you're winning because you uh, change city, uh, city council's uh, notion of how to go forward. And therefore, that should be a source of great inspiration that what you're doing is working and that you're working in line with VISTA, which is something that I used when I was director of missions. VISTA means include every voice, make sure that what you do has integrity, make sure that the structure you do it in is sound, make sure there's transparency and make sure it is accountable to the people. So God bless us with the continued inspiration that we need in order to go forward. 